places. People. History. Culture. Art. The Seven Seas. An ECU student production. Hi, I'm Anthony Sherrod, and thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Seven Seas, the show where we explore and discuss the various and diverse cultures that encompass Pride Nation. Today, we continue our journey into the country of Japan. To help us do so, we're joined by Dr. Saichio Sherman, professor in ECU School of Communication, who is here to discuss Japanese culture. And later, we'll be joined by Dr. Joanne Bath, a professor in ECU School of Music who will educate us on the Suzuki approach to learning music. Dr. Sherman, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So growing up in Japan, what do you remember most? I do remember a lot of things, of course, but I do remember my mother's cooking. Um, it, she is a great cook, and my grandmother, actually, who cooked a lot for us, she was a great cook, too. And so I do remember a lot about those food, which I miss here, I guess. So what, what, would, what would be some traditional dishes um, centric to Japan? Um, well, here, I guess you hear sushi a lot, and you can get sushi, so that's definitely one. But w even the sushi is not always the one that, you know, like the rice bowl, and low fish on top. It's actually, there are a variety of sushi. I mean, of course you do maybe know rolled sushi, um, but we have like a sushi that have like fish and vegetables scattered in the rice or over the rice. And so there are a variety of it and I do love those food. Um, and there are many other dishes that I guess I do miss, um, but I try to cook at home, I guess. And that's how I try to uh, have a taste here, I guess. So you have sushi, you have um, the samurai, you have calligraphy. Mm -hmm. um, what other um, parts of Japan's history well, would you like Japan to be recognized for? Okay. Um, okay, so cooking is definitely one, right? So if you mention samurai or the bushido spilling, um, uh, I guess martial arts are the one, uh, is one of the, I guess, cultural um, um, tradition that, that we appreciate. Um, within martial arts, I'm sure you have heard, you know, karate, like, you know, in the movie Karate Kids and all that. Um, but they do have other type of martial arts, which is kudo, um, archery with um, bow and, you know, um, and kendo, which is the, the way of swords. So they use um, wooden sword, of course, not the real one, but do training and, you know, um, and actually fight imitation of fight. And so um, those are the things that I definitely appreciate. But the, the, the culture is complex. Um, so any single culture, it's hard to describe with, you know, simple adjectives. And I would say the complex nature of Japanese culture, like, like any other culture, has the ambivalence, you know, the Japan values the tradition and history and the something that's old. Uh, but they still value innovation and something that's new. Like, you know, they try to constantly innovate electric appliances and cars and whatnot. So, so that's the quality I would, I guess, speak to. And, and to that, um, mm -hmm. when, when thinking of, um, I guess, the traditional um, Japanese family, mm -hmm. how would you describe that? Well, um, we do value closeness within a family. So like, you know, just to use as my family as an example, my mother would, try to make sure that we eat it together uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. Of course, you know, during the lunchtime, they would be working and we'll, kids would be at school. But so she would make sure that we would be seated, all the foods are ready, but we have to all be seated in one spot and, you know, in one table and then we have to all wait each other. Let's say if my brother is late or doing something else, then everybody would be tortured in front of food and waiting, for example. So, so the collectivistic nature that is demonstrated in that example is definitely one. And, and we value extended families, I guess. It, not so much anymore, but we used to do a lot of things with um, grandparents and you know, extended families, relatives. Um, so we have like Ancestor Day uh, um, in August. And tip, or we um, kind of get together 
for the um, religious ceremony after, for the person who had passed away. So we would have anniversary for the day the person has passed away and all the families and you know relatives would get together and so commemorate or think about the person, for example. So I guess there are lots of those events that where you know extended family would get together, I guess. So um, and you spoke of Ancestor Day. What are some other holidays celebrated in Japan? Um, Just a couple. See, people in Japan work too much. So um, we <laughs> do have um, many national holidays so that they would you know, be listing. Um, what we have, OK, we have what we call Golden Week in May. And there is a Children's Day. May 5th is the Children's Day. So kids celebrate the you know, their, I guess, youth and the parents celebrate it too, um, so that they could take day off and be with kids. That really and sounds so, fascinating. Right, like, I know, kids go, today. Golden Week sounds incredible. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, we thank you for joining us, Dr. Sherman. And now we're going to take a look at what ECU students know about the country of Japan in this week's edition of Global IQ. so much about Japan. Food is great. I love Japanese food. Uh, Japan is a great place. My uncle actually lived there. My best friend, he's in the Air Force and they stationed him in Japan. Very smart people. I'd love to visit Japan. They have uh, a lot of technology that comes out of there. Japan, that's the uh, country of the rising sun because apparently since the sun rises in the east it's supposed to hit them first. Um, you know, they're a nice country. They. Uh, They've always been pretty organized, you know, going back to their age of when they had like samurai and all that. They always had a very nice class structure and everything. I know it's very like disciplined. Their bands and music and food and so forth is influenced by some Western culture, even fashion and so forth. Um, but as far as like, you know, the food and their culture, I'm, it's, it's definitely different than anywhere else in the world. So they wear kimonos, and I've seen the memoirs of a geisha. I don't know if that was like correlated, but they do, they do ladies like that. They do hibachi and like sushi and stuff. And their perception of beauty is, for the most part, a lot different than ours, you know. You think about in like our culture, you know, tall, dark, but in their culture, like very pale features, very like smooth, like, you know, just I guess the idea of continuity throughout, very smooth, and um, throughout their artwork and everything, one of the greatest forms of artwork in Japan is landscape, appreciating the beauty in nature. And we're back. Thank you for um, tuning back in. We're now joined by Joanne Bath. Pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. So we're talking about the Suzuki approach to music. Who is the mastermind behind that teaching? A man from Japan named Shinichi Suzuki. He was born in 1898 and grew up as the son of the owner of the largest violin manufacturing company in the world. And I'm told we have actually have a violin with us. Yes, and it's actually from that violin factory. The very first one. That's for very small children, like three-year-olds. Three-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, what is the philosophy behind the Suzuki approach? One of the remarkable things is that it, it, there's a very definite philosophy, and it may be the only meth method or way of teaching music that actually has a philosophy. Um, Suzuki thought of this way of teaching children at the end of the Second World War, where he saw so much devastation around them, and he was so bothered by that, and wondered how he could give beauty in their lives. And he realized if you can play the violin, you can hear the beauty of the music. So he figured out how to teach the children by just observing how all children in the world learn to speak their native language and their dialect. And he realized that was because they hear their parents speaking. And also, it's really interesting to notice that when parents are teaching their children to speak, they never scold them. They never tell them about their mistakes. They always are just happy to have them speaking, and they just lead them on and on. So he just adapted that over. So the philosophy includes such things as work, the parents teaching the children, the studio teachers teach the parents how to teach the children, and the environment must be very positive and encouraging. 
because we all do better when we think we're doing well. And um, it's based on the same way we learn language with listening. So the, there's a whole set of recordings that Suzuki made, starting with Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, and going all the way through Mozart concertos. And the children listen to them constantly so that the brain is trained in a very special way. And uh, Harvard has just recently documented the fact that the brains of children who are trained this way for music before, by, by ear before speaking actually have a different patterning than the, uh, the basic brain of a child. It really was a, um, a revolutionary teaching technique. Um, what impact did it have on um, Japan culture? Um, on Japan's culture, it meant that a lot of children, a lot of people learned Western music. And it was a lot started because, um, the, in, originally because one of the emperors decided that he wanted to have exposure to other countries, so he, he wanted to have classical music. The big influence that, that I think is what it had on music around the world in other countries as well as Japan. So I think that Japan, for one of the best gifts we, any of us have received was the gift of having Shinichi Suzuki from Japan. So, and with that, um, while it was originated with the violin, what other instruments has it um, been adapted for? Well, uh, viola, cello, piano, flute, uh, string bass, guitar, um, voice recorder, almost anything. One of the fascinating things to me is the way the Suzuki approach has affected education generally in this country. And it's meant that children are being taught in a positive way and encouraged. And then the other area is in sports, where children used to be taught or told how badly they were doing. Now I find that coaches are telling them, good try. You almost made it. You know, things like that. That, is so, that, was, that was so revolutionary when Suzuki came to this country because all of us in my, my generation were brought up being told all the things we did wrong and usually weren't told how to fix them. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty negative. That's why so many people dropped out early, and very few people drop out in Suzuki. How, how did you be, um, first become interested in um, the Suzuki approach? Well, first of all, I had sworn I would never teach. I had no intention of teaching. I just wanted to perform and be a good mother and wife. And or, I, you know, that. <laughs> but, but we were um, living in Kansas, and we had two little girls. And I heard there was going to be a conference on music for young children. I went. And the man who, this is, well, actually, this is the first conference out of Japan, and it was uh, taught by John Kendall, who brought the, the approach out of Japan. And the first words he said were, this is the way children and their parents can learn to work peacefully together. So you see that the great tie-in between the, at the end of the Second World War, and this was in 1964, actually, so it was 20 years after Suzuki started teaching this way in Japan. So I, I went, and I was so impressed, and from then on, I just, I just became a Suzuki teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and you've done well for yourself. Thank you. Um, what else would you like to um, tell us about the Suzuki method? Well, it really has affected so many people. Here in Greenville, was, this was one, well, in Greenville was one of the very first places in the world to have a Suzuki program. Um, other than in Japan. And so it's been fascinating to watch the 45 years I've been teaching Suzuki here to see the wonderful results, not only in playing the violin, but the, because of the philosophy and the way the children are taught how to learn, how they're taught discipline, they're learned, taught to perform. It means they're ready to go on into big careers, whether it's performance or whether it's in you know, one of the professions like medicine or law or science. So the results have been incredible, and I've kept track of all the ones. I guess I've taught about 400 children here. And the thing is that we start them at three or four and teach them all the way through high school. So it's really very nurturing for it's them. It's very nurturing. So and we thank you for your insight, and we thank you for um, educating us on the Suzuki method, and thank you for being with us. Thank you. I always enjoy talking about Suzuki. <laughs> thank you, um, Mrs. Babb. And we'll be back after this brief break.
Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Seven Seas as we explored and discussed um, Japanese culture. Um, we'd also like to thank um, Dr. Sachio Shearman and Mrs. Joanne Bath for joining us and providing us um, with that knowledge. Um, we'd also like to thank you for tuning in and invite you to tune in next week as we continue our journey into the country of Russia. Thank you.